everybody, my name is Noel Calling from Feebus Limited and in this talk I'd like to discuss whether C plus is a safer C. Now imagine many of you have never heard of C plus because it doesn't really exist but what I'm really talking about here is that the the overlap between C plus plus and C and whether it makes any sense to use a C plus plus compiler but still fundamentally write in C. If we look at the two languages we see that C plus plus is a near superset of C, it's not a complete superset of C there are a few areas that, that don't work within C++, but generally we can think of overset. However, we also, so C++ is this overlap, but what I'm also going to discuss is a sort of a slightly extended overlap. So there are certain things in modern C++ that we can use if we're using a C++ compiler that are fundamentally still look like C and feel like C, but bring us some aspects regarding safety and security, and may be worth considering in projects, especially around you know, deeply embedded in IoT type projects. First thing we've got though is we've got to realize that that overlap is going to vary depending on the language standards. So in C, we've got a number of language standards out there with C18 being the latest. I say most people are probably working to C99, a few are working to C11. I've not seen anybody working to C18. And the same, of course, has happened in C++. And when we talk about modern C++, we're generally dealing with anything post C++ 11. So there's this three-year iteration. So, for example, C++ 23 is being worked on. And these features, some are quite small, some are quite significant in terms of the language. So the overlap of the, the C part of C++ and this extended part will vary depending on those two standards we talk about. In terms of what I'm not going to talk about is the more traditional C++ areas. So, so areas that you probably may be familiar with if you've heard about a C++ classes, the inheritance structure for subtyping, virtual functions give us dynamic dispatching, exceptions and templates. So they're all outside of this discussion. They're very C++ centric. And I don't want to get into those. It was so a really it's here still using C as C in its main area. Now, the reality is most good C will compile today with a C++ and most modern environments are offering both a the, the front it's only the front end that's different so it's purely the file extension which, which will dictate when you invoke the compiler which actually parser it goes through so in a simple case you can take most .c files change the extension to a recognizable one by a C++ compiler .cpp probably being the most recognizable one and it will just recompile but now the front end will go through the C++ parser rather than through the C parser and the majority of good C will just work you won't have to make any changes to the code it would just compile so the question is what wouldn't compile if I go down that well there's a link down there to something called Compiler Explorer. If you've not seen Compiler Explorer, I highly recommend following that link. If you type that link, it will take you to some C code and show you an example of C code that will compile with a C compiler, but would not compile with a C++ compiler. Most of the examples are just bad code. Some have changed, for example, from C90 to C99, the use of function prototypes being required. In C90, of course, they're not. Areas around the difference between the empty brackets and a prototype and something like a void star differ between, say, C and C++. The only other things to be aware of are the fact that we've got additional keywords in C++ that if you were using as an identifier, for example, if you use the keyword new, in a C program as an identifier like int new, that would of course not compile in C++ because new is one of the keywords in C++. But the majority of code is said there, and actually if you're working for something like Misra, pretty much all of that area is would be covered by MISRA. MISRA would ban any of that type of code in your. So that's what I mean by good, good, good is a subjective term. But good code, in my view, is anything that's going to pass the, MISRA, the general MISRA rules in there. So you've got MISRA compliant code. It's pretty much going to compile with a C++ compiler with new, no changes associated with it. So the question is, what, why would you ever think about doing this? Well, the reality is it, it is already out there. And two major platforms you're probably familiar with. So Arduino is a very widely used platform, very useful platform for rapid prototyping. Used probably more in the maker community than the professional community. But is a very widely supported platform because of the hardware support and the additional add-on boards. When you're actually using Arduino and you're writing the code, which I'm sure if you've ever done, just looks like C, is actually going through a C++ compiler. And many of the Arduino supporting libraries are C++ libraries and full C++ libraries. They're just hiding the difference from you. The other, say, professional platform is ARM's Embed. So the ARM Embed is this, this now their IoT offering 
and it has a whole set of libraries, whole set of environments supporting a whole vast array of boards to allow you to do deeply embed and especially IoT type aspects in the embed. The embed is a full C++ environment. So all of the libraries written there are written in C++. Actually, right down the roots of it, it's still, still C. There's still some C areas. But fundamentally, the whole environment is C, and it relies on there being a C, the ARM C++ compiler to use that. So these two environments are massively used in the industry. They're out there and being used today, and both happen to use C++. If we look at and compare the offerings between them, then both of these codes, so on the left, we've got the Arduino code. And if you look at that code, it's, it looks like C. There's nothing really there to indicate it's not C. So Arduino is probably more centric towards C in terms of the way you write for Arduino. It's more likely it has closer feel to C programs. And they very much position it more in the, the way they teach it. They talk about C. If we look at the embed side doing exactly, so these are both the hello world of an embedded, which is flashing the LED. If we look at the ARM embed code, the, the giveaways there probably the way that the LED object is being created, hiding all the drivers, that it's actually using a class space to create this LED. Uh, but it's still using things like hash defines in there. Uh, still our standard include one. And the other giveaway there is the while true without using something like stud ball in there instead of the while one loop or infinite loop. But otherwise, again, that looks like C, the LED equals one is using a particular feature of, of C++ we'll talk about called overloading in that. So their standard application level code. So both of them are designed to write the application level code very much as C style code in there, but actually they're both using C++ engines for deeply embedded aspects. We know the Arduino and Embed can go down to very, very small systems and still give us the same efficiency from a code space and a runtime perspective as we would have with the C program. So that's very important also to, to emphasize is that we, we're not going to get those overheads that people think you're going to get from C++ in there. So the next question is, what, what is this extended set? Now, in the time available, I, I, there's a limited amount of time I can go through here. So really, I would just want to give you some indication of if I'm using a C++ compiler, but I'm still really writing for C, what sort of things could I use? Could I utilize? So again, I don't have to use any of these because standard C is going to compile. But there's some nice features, especially when we're talking about safety and security, that can actually just make our language safer just by inherently using the features of, of C++ that are not in the current C standard. Sorry. So the first quick wins, the, the very easy ones are the fact that the Boolean type in C++ is a true type. It's not a true type in C. The, the, the underscore bool is still actually an integral type, an integer type with zero, one being mapped on true false. So there are a couple of cases there when we look at the Boolean, and it, it overcomes this discussion about how do I write the if statement. So there's a number of miserable rules around there regarding this concept called an effective Boolean. So the C++ Boolean gives us the Misra effective Boolean. It is a Boolean, it's a separate type in its own right. It's not part of the integral set. A nice feature added in 14, something I use a lot in the embedded space, is finally we have binary literals. So we've always had hex, octal, and decimal, but now the zero B gives us a binary number. And of course, when we're down at register level, when we're dealing with bit manipulation, it's nice to be able to write those out as binary values rather than having to do that, you know, that constant conversion to hex when necessary. One important part of language whenever we're dealing with pointers is the concept of a null pointer. Now, again, in C, we have the capital N U W L, the null, but that actually is not formally defined in the standard. Now, a lot of people use zero, and again, Misra has some rules around there, to, and of course, zero is really an integral value. It's, it's defined as a signed integer, even though it's zero. We use that, and this can lead to, again, minor mistakes and ambiguities in the code where zero is being misinterpreted from a code perspective. And it's not from a type perspective and a safety perspective, it's not correct from a typing perspective. So C++ introduced, modern C++ introduced this new object, new type called null pointer, null pointer type for explicit use. And this has certain benefits that they would clarify and when we're working with our code, and it means static analysis tools can ensure that when we're dealing with pointers and we want to check for null pointer, we want to set null pointer, then we guarantee that is being managed. It also has the capability that in an if statement, we can just use the, the, the pointer value. We don't have to say 
do, you know, is not null, uh, that the standard allowed for that and the coding standards allow for that. Another feature again for the deeply embedded space is C++17 introduced a type called byte. And byte is basically built on top of uintake, which of course is really built on unsigned char. And standard byte, the difference between byte and uintake is that byte is not an arithmetic type. So you can't add bytes together, you can't multiply bytes. And where they're very useful is where you've got string data, so serial ports, for example, any network communication, and I want to serialize data and send it out, I can guarantee I can have, for example, arrays of bytes. And there's, again, no ambiguities about the manipulation of those in terms of arithmetic values. They can only be, we can convert bytes to integers and vice versa, or bytes to any type, of course. There are standard facilities to do that, but it ensures that when I've got a, effectively a raw number, I can keep it in that raw number form as I pass it around my system. I use it as parameter values. The other thing I've shown there on the slide is another feature that can make re code readability is the, in, the ability to use, introduce separators in literal values. And, and these can be used on both decimal and hex, but here I've shown on the binary, these little ticks. And we can introduce them wherever we want. The, the typical guidance on a binary is you ever do it every two digits, on a hex you do it every four digits, on a decimal every three digits. And again, certainly if we're dealing with you know 32 bit values or even 64 bit values, being able to separate out a literal in terms of the readability, again, it just that missing a zero, the number of times I've seen in code where there's an address being used and the address is missing a zero. And that of course the code then just doesn't work and it's not obvious. Finally in 20, they, they did something that it, it's always amazed me, it's taken so long to happen, is they've standardized the signed integer to two's complement. I mean, in, in my whole career, you know, many decades now, every architecture I've worked on, the, the signed integer is a two's complement representation at the, at the hardware architecture at the instruction set level. Finally, C++ have standardized that and saying, to, you know, that all signed integers are now two complements and that a right shift on a, on a signed value is guaranteed to be an arithmetic shift. So again, that addressing some of the miserable rules we have implicitly in language, we now know that is going to be the case associated with it. Another number of subtle changes we have in the language, and it has always been that, that the C++ class is built on top of the, uh, on top of C, the original work by Straustrup. Uh, the struct and the class, the, the class is built on top of the struct. So structs in C++ have the benefit that we don't have to use type defs to be able to create objects of them. So that just cleans up a lot of code, saves a lot of use of type defs, and just means from a syntactical, especially when you're doing editors, you're doing reviews, it's just cleaner. The other nice feature added in modern C++ is the new form of initialization. It's called brace initialization. So the example here, waypoint WP, those curly brackets. There's a num many different ways we can initialize objects now, but that one is very useful because it guarantees to a zero initialize all of the members of the structure automatically. And there, there are various ways we can do that. Another area addressed is the ambiguity of constant. So const in C has different meanings depending on the context and it's not guaranteed to be a com an actual compile time constant. C++ introduced something called const expression. That must be a, a compile time constant. So it guarantees. Now the benefit of const expression has say over hash define is it has type and it has scope. So we can have const expressions local to, for example, a function and limit the scope of a constant rather than having to use a hash define for that. So reducing dependency on the preprocessor, which again can help and also speed up things like compilation. Type def, you know, type def one of things always unreadable. <laughs> it's, it's a real pain, especially with non-trivial things like function pointers. So C++ has a new directive called using. Type def is still supported, but we can do the using directive associated with this, where uh, it's a basic replacement. It's an alias, a type alias. So there you can see the two examples of doing it using a type def for a function pointer and using it for a uh, the using directive for the type alias. And it, again, it just makes code more readable and more passable and less likely for subtle errors to, 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 to uh, creep into the language. One area that I think is most significant to the language is the extensions to enums. Now I use enums a lot. In C, we tend not to use enums hugely because they're really just named integers. They're not truly enumerated type. Where in C++ they are, they're a separate type. And the big changes in modern C++ first is that we can create an enum class. 
And this then creates what's called the equivalent of an essential enome in MISRA C. This is a, an individual type. It's no longer an integral type. So you have no implicit conversion to and from integers with an enum-based class, uh, scope class is called. You can convert, but we have to use casting. So it's just ensuring that if we're doing type conversion, we're going through a casting mechanism rather than using implicit. And of course, we know implicit is one of the weaknesses of any safety standard. The other very useful feature is we can now specify the underlying type. So again, there's all this amb ambiguity in the C standard regarding the, the, the compiler, its implementation dependent of the size type used for an enum. And that makes them pretty much impossible to use in it where we have packing or padding, so in arrays, but mainly in things like structures. We can't typically use an enum as a member in structure because we just can't guarantee the layout rules. We can now do that with modern C++ by specifying that type. Now overloading is one of these areas a lot of people don't understand. There's the different forms of overloading. One of the forms of overloading, operator overload. So that statement there, we're familiar in C. We know what that means. You know, we've got multiplication going there. However, depending on context, then the, if we look on the left-hand side, we're doing integer multiplication. On the right-hand side, we're doing floating point multiplication. And if we looked at, for example, generated assembler from an ARM processor, we see quite differing uh, different codes. So on the right, because the ARM is an integer engine, it, it has the, the multiplier op, op code within that. But because of the floating point, then the default behavior is it's branching out to the ABI library, obviously, without depending on code processor support. Within that. So that's what we mean typically by static polymorphic behavior, that it's type specific behavior, but it's decided at compile time. Now, C++ has this capability, and the reason we use static polymorphic behavior is, as we did in the previous slide, it's about algorithmic abstraction. It allows us to focus on what we're trying to do rather than how we're doing it. So take, for example, from the standard library, we have things like absolute, we have like sign, and because of the C directive regarding the one definition rule, we have to have separate functions for, you know, long and long, long for the absolute and, and float and long double for the sign where in C++, because of operate function overloading, we can have a single function called absolute, but have multiple implementations of that. And at compile time, it links to the correct implementation. So good use of, of abstraction operator overloading, and we can do this for any operator, we can do this for most operators and for our own functions as well. Then it just means that when we're reviewing code and we're looking at the code, we focus on what we're trying to do rather than how it's being, being done. And that's just general abstraction in engineering. If you're not familiar with them, there's a useful uh, out there called, uh, facility out there called Common Weakness and Immigration uh, managed by MITRE. Uh, so it's, it relates to the CV database. And there's a number of well-defined typical errors we get in programming. And one of the classic ones is the off by one error. So there you can see a web link if you want to read more of it. So the classic one by one error is a product calculates or uses an incorrect maximum minimum value that is one more or one less than the correct value. Very, very common error. And one of the most common reasons time we will see this is where we're iterating over a loop iteration, especially over an array, and we go past the end of the array. So, so the out of array bands is, is a common known problem. So a feature added in modern C++ is a new, is a re, it, we've got the standard for loop as we have in C, but we also have a new form of for loop called a range for loop. And this is used for containers, so any form of container, an array being a container. And this very simply allows us to write code like this, very Python-like, in the fact we can say, okay, I want to iterate over that array from the first element to the last element, and we don't have to worry about our zero and, and n minus one type iteration. And the compiler would generate the, the same code as if we'd written this manually to, to, inter, to pointer iterate over that array and v will take on the individual values now here we've done it by copy we can do it by pointer we can do it by reference but in for an integer obviously it's, it's efficient to do it by copy so again that eliminates immediately these off what by one error so if i change the size of values that loop doesn't have to change that loop's always going to iterate from the first element to the last element another aspect that can again reduce actually error count and simplify code it was added in modern c++ called auto type deduction now again this is compile time evaluation it's not runtime evaluation 
So in, under certain contexts, the compiler can deduce what that type is. The fact that the values array is an array of u int 8s, it knows that v itself therefore must be a u int 8. That then again means that if I change that values array to being a u int 16 or say u int 32, that loop doesn't have to change. So this gives us stability in the code base. This has a big knock-on effect to the type of regression testing we want to have because of the, the, the management of change. And we don't have to use lots of type defs just to make this code more useful. So the autotype deduction, there's many different uses of the autotype deduction, um, but this is the simplest one in a lot of code. And again, it is just simplifying the, the management and maintenance of code and reducing the potential to inject errors from a safety and security. The other thing they added, uh, which again, I look at things I use a lot in embedded C++, is a thin wrapper called standard array. Now under the covers, this is the C array. It is the same memory model as a standard array as we had in those previous slides. Just by creating this wrapper around it, it gives us a number of other facilities. So there are a number of functions, supplied functions, that are available to standard arrays. So simple ones like sorting array. There is, you can literally now say values.sort, and you can define the predicate sorting if you want to. Uh, there are capabilities to do things like finding, finding the max value. You once you have standard array, you have the availability of a number of algorithms supported by the standard library that we can use without the overhead. So, this, so again, the important thing here is there is no memory overhead, and this is not a dynamic object. The, the object is created as it would be with a normal array. The fact is a static allocated model here for memory is exactly the same as the C array. So it just allows us to again ensure that certain code is managed and more readable, and it again eliminates certain subtle errors, and it removes, especially when we come to parameters and using arrays as parameters, it removes the ambiguity that what's called the decay of arrays into pointers, and that, and we know there's always that that complication of when is an array an array, and when is an array a pointer. Another example where where C plus plus can help us is another classic uh, weakness is the unchecked return value. So the software does not check the return value from a method or function which can prevent it from detecting unexpected states or conditions. Now, there's actually a MISRA directive for this in the latest MISRA. This used to be a MISRA rule, but it's, it's unenforceable. How can a static anal analysis tool know that a return value from a function is actually error information? So they, they changed it in the, in the MISRA 2012 version, the MISRA 3 version into a directive which is directive 4.7. If a function returns error information, the error information shall be tested. So generally that can only be, be checked using manual review because it's almost impossible for a static analysis tool to check on that. Certain things they try, but it's always gonna generate noise if we're not careful. C++ has been adding this concept of attributes. And these are additional, these are very similar to the compiler directive. So most, tool chains allow you to give certain directives. So for example, things like GCC use the attribute directive to allow you, but the problem is these are non-portable because they depend on the individual tool chains. So for a lot of common ones that we would like to do, now C++ is adding these directives to the language which we can use. So one of the, the important ones here is the ability to tag a return value for a function as no discard. So here we've got a function called my fail returning and in, we've tagged it as no discard. If I then call that code, call that function, and I don't use the return value, what's called the R value expression, uh, on a standard compiler, then now that will generate a warning at the moment. So the moment these, these are general warnings. So here we can see the warning from from particular compiler showing that the, the, the call uh, has you might say is ignoring that return value. So again, it doesn't enforce the use of it, but at least it means that if there is important information being passed, it must at least be assigned with that. I mean, we can only go so far with static analysis and ensuring people do the right thing. There's another, under, many more useful ones as well. So a nice one, there's a fall through one now, for example, on switch statements to again, switch that mode from being the, the no fall through, the break as the default. And if you do want to fall through, you explicitly have to say that. And, and as each iteration of the language, they're adding more and more attribute specifiers so we, we can improve our code as necessary. And just to wrap up, I just want to go through a couple of examples. And again, I don't expect you to, to, to deal with all the code at the moment, but I just want to sort of give you a taste of the sort of things that 
that using a C++ compiler, but still fundamentally writing C can do, how it can potentially simplify code and improve code. So here's a bit of C++, modern C++. And at the top, we've got a struct of a pair with two doubles in that. So that's a fairly big object, relatively big object. They're going to be typically 64 bytes each. Um, so a, a big object. Now, normally, if we're returning this in a function, we would err away from that. In C, we would normally return that possibly as, a, as an out pointer, so a non-const pointer being returned. Because normally, if we returned an object like that, a struct, we would be worried about stack usage and the overheads of the stack usage and the copying of objects from the local scope to the actual return scope. Modern C++ at 17 enforced a concept which a lot of compilers already use, but, but you rely on the compiler optimization. It's something called copy lesion. And copy and lesion then guarantees that if we have a, an object being returned like this, this, this pair object, that it won't generate any temporaries. So it will guarantee to do the efficiency of generating no additional copies associated with that. And by having that as part of the standard, it means we can change the style of code in what we call the idiomatic code to be more function-like. You, know, fun you, know, you think of the term function comes from X as a function of Y. It's the return object. And we've always had to play games when we've got non-trivial return objects to use this idea of out parameters. So it simplifies a lot of code and makes the code actually more intuitive because when I want to return something, I just return it from the function, knowing the guarantee now in the language is there is no copy overhead associated with that. That's paired with a, another feature called structure binding. So structure binding is the ability to unpack a complex object into its component parts as part of the return. So that, that statement might look quite fun. Again, it looks very Python-like, but the auto in brackets x pos and x neg equals solve, solve credit means that that pair being returned, the two doubles, automatically get assigned to the x pos x neg, at an x neg as individual doubles. So there's actually no structure ever generated in this code. It's direct assignment from that return calculation to x pos and x nev. And again, you have to look at the assembler to actually see how this works, but it's all to do with the way compilers can do optimization under that. And that's, again, a very standard style of modern code is using this combination of structured bindings with non-trivial return objects to automatically unpack this. And you can even unpack things like arrays being returned, that standard array, that can actually be returned and they can be unpacked into their, their individual elements as well. Another feature to, because this, this has changed the style of coding in 17, this, this ability to return non-trivial types, then they've added to the language something called a standard tuple. Um, so a tuple is, think of it as an ad, ad hoc structure. So anywhere where I might want to create a structure of just plain data, I can now do that as a tuple without having to create the explicit struct itself and name it. So especially when it's only been used in one context. So here I've replaced that standard pair object I created with a standard tuple of two doubles. And we even have what's called a factory function called make tu tuple to make the return statement very easy. That's still guaranteeing copy elision. So that same code again guarantees no specific overheads when assigning to that x pos x nev within that. So again, it may look complex, but it actually reduces the amount of code we have to write and reduces the noise of additional types that are only being used in very narrow context within them. And finally, again, to finish off this, we can use the using directive to wrap the tuple up in a pair if we want that level of readability. But then, so, so there's our using directive for the type alias. But building on the tuple is a concept called standard optional. Now, this has really changed the style of error management in modern C++. So moving away, we know in the deeply embedded space, we're not going to use exceptions. Again, quite often, they're not supported by deeply embedded compilers. So standard optional allows, allows us to wrap any type, including our scalar types like ints, in this optional pair, in this optional object. And really optional is, is an object with a Boolean hidden from us. We have a new object called null, null opt. If I return null opt, then that, that Boolean is effectively set to false. There's no object associated with it. Alternatively, I can just return the, the tuple and it will work. That means in my main code, that we can now return that object and we get an optional object back. And I can interrogate whether the optional is populated or not using an if statement. 
So that if statement, if a null opt is returned, then the if doesn't, the main body of the if is not executed. So it's, it's very similar to like, like the null pointer model is the same idea that the null op means it's it's not populated where if i if it hits the line we make tuple that then that that option is populated and we have to unpack it so the idea is you can see the star rv so it uses the same notations we would for pointers i can then use the structure binding to unpack that pair into its individual elements within that so that's very modern c plus plus but still ultimately very c-like code just using free stuff it's a long way away from standard c but it's just building on the capabilities of the modern language which is giving us efficiency but more importantly it's allowing us to narrow scope so we're doing everything within that if statement and, the, and again misra directives and, and any coding standards like 2662 or 6358 safety standards one of the directives is always looking to narrow scope and these new capabilities give us that ability to, to narrow down that scope. And there's many more examples. Again, we haven't got the time here to go through all these examples, but a whole load of different examples here is the use of context express functions, which mean compile time const, const, uh, compile time functions. So, so we're replacing things like function macros, auto type parameters are very interesting to make again to get rid of function macros standard variant is a replacement for union standard any is a replacement for, for void pointers smart pointers if we were using dynamic memory again most of the time we're not but if we were it gives us a, a non-leakage model for the use of, of pointers pmr polymorphic memory resources in 17 allows you to create your own static memory pools for containers so this is, this is where you might have written your own memory model memory management model you can actually now do that within standard c plus plus and another useful feature is around time there's a chrono library which we can map onto hardware timers and we even have the capability to write things like 250 ms for milliseconds as all that is built into the now standard library is all the timing and, and date facilities as part of the language and we have used those in deeply embedded systems so to wrap up, why would we potentially consider C plus? Uh, does it does it actually make sense? Now, I'm sure many of you. The answer is no. I'm sure I'm not going to convince you in the time we've got here that that C plus is a good idea. But most of the tool chains you're using have C plus plus as an option as well. You'll see that most good tool chains will support C and C plus plus. And there may be certain cases, say libraries, library support, and because there's standard linkage between C and C plus plus. So it's a minor superset of C. Like I say, good C will work in C plus plus, and again, immediately gets rid of most of those miserable things we couldn't do anyway. From a software engineering perspective, from a safety perspective, the, the thing it does bring is improved type checking. Now, again, we can use Misra and Misra can go, as, you know, and, and I would still use Misra, but there are some things Misra just cannot catch. And that's where the directives come in. And many of those areas around type checking, the use of type, we can enforce type correctness through the language. And C++ has much greater capabilities than C does to enforce type matching within that. It can catch some of those common weaknesses like the no discard we can enforce that which we can't do even with static analysis and certainly most importantly i think is the improved scoping the reduction of the use of the preprocessor anytime you're using the preprocessor we lose scoping because of course it's a preprocessor directive it's not actually using any form of scope of preprocessing so any time we can narrow scoping we reduce certainly when we've got error diagnostics and error, error management we can reduce that and more quickly uh, modify the code and reduce the impact of code. It can improve memory management if we're doing it. There's a lot of stuff, also compile time and runtime memory management. Going back to the const expression means there are many functions you can push to compile time evaluation. So there's actually no code generated for them. And any time we reduce the, the use of preprocess and preprocess complexity, it's going to make our code better. It's going to make it more readable, but also it's going to improve build times. Very importantly, it, it, the, we can now see that the improvement of the post-process analysis of the uh, token count of post-process files is a real issue in build times. So I hope that's given you food for thought. Uh, like I say, I don't expect to convince you and certainly there's hardness here broken as I'll never convince you. But it's worth being aware that with a modern C++ compiler, 
and well-written code, well-written C code, you'll get the same object output. So the object code size, the runtime performance will be identical between running it through the .c and the .c++ front end with good modern compilers. With that transition, we have a number of features in modern C++ that potentially are available to us that without getting into the whole C++ language, it just give us a capability to improve type safety in a language, which in the embedded space and the I2 space is, is paramount in modern code. So I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch this. Uh, here are my contact details. There's a lot of information on the blog. The blog's been going for over a decade now. So much of the things I've spoken about are, are on the blog as well. Uh, and our YouTube channel, we have a number of our, our own webinars on there that, that uh, cover some of the areas like quality, code quality, etc. And there's my direct contact details if you want to contact me. Otherwise, I'll thank you very much. Yourself.